as you know, my whole shtick, my whole thing is figuring out what works for most people most of the time based on science, not opinion, to put the odds in your favor. And that's what I did for myself. And I realized that for me, the reason that I want a relationship is for a deep abiding intimacy and security and love. And that if I don't feel intimate, secure and loved and loving towards someone, then no amount of the external trappings is ever gonna do it for me. Welcome to yourbrilliance.com. I'm your host, Amy Waterman. And today we're talking about how high your standards should be when it comes to men. Set your standards too high and you'll never find anyone good enough. But set your standards too low and you'll end up selling for guys who just don't deserve you. Where do you think you fall on that scale? Are you a perfectionist or have you settled too many times? Well, today's guest is going to help you find that perfect balance. Dr. Duana Welch is known for using social science to solve real world problems. She's a professor whose work has appeared in Psychology Today, Time, Red Book, and the Huffington Post. She went on her own journey to find true love, and the result was a happy marriage and her first book, Love Factually 10 Proven Steps from I Wish to I Do. Welcome, Duana. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Amy. It's wonderful to be on your show. So you talk about your journey to find lasting love in your book, and you say that when you were dating, I love this, you say, my standards were like a bad play on the three bears story. I didn't know whether they were too low, unreasonably high, or just right. Can you give us some juicy examples? Well, yeah, for example, uh, there were times when I went for what everyone says you should go for, the tall, rich, handsome guy who is well-connected and seems to have a great family, and yet I was bored to tears. So I don't know, is that too high a standard to want to actually find someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with interesting? Yeah, that's a tough one because, hey, I mean, if he's got money and connections, maybe that makes up for it. <laughs> and for some people, maybe it does but not for me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, as you know, my whole shtick, my whole thing is figuring out what works for most people most of the time based on science, not opinion, to put the odds in your favor. And that's what I did for myself. And I realized that for me, the reason that I want a relationship is for a deep abiding intimacy and security and love. And that if I don't feel intimate, secure and loved, and loving towards someone, then no amount of the external trappings is ever gonna do it for me. And that's really interesting because there are two kind of different sets of standards we think about. We think about the internal standards. We think about whether he's caring, whether he's warm, whether we feel safe, but then there's also the standards that we see on online dating sites because we can't see whether he's warm and connected on internet dating sites. All we can see is, what he looks like, what he does for a living, how tall he is. So it seems that at first, it's those external standards that kind of draw us in. Yeah, so what happens is that the externals bring people closer, but if you don't have the internals to back it up, you don't usually succeed in keeping a good partner. Right. So this is one of the things that we see is that we see, you know, all women are going to worry about these things. They're going to worry about, is this guy good enough for me? You know, does he have a good income? Does he have prospects? This is like, you know, Jane Austen stuff. It's always been that way. But if we wait too long, then we know that our options drop off. So what I want to know is whether or not, how much is the, is the real world, the real modern women torn between these two standards? Because on the other hand, Online dating shows that we've got tons of options out there. There's a lot of divorcees coming back on the market. Maybe we don't actually have to worry about it anymore because it's going to work out in the end. That's a really interesting perspective and one that nobody's really shared with me before. So uh, I want to respond first by saying I love Jane Austen and I'm in the middle of Pride and Prejudice for the millionth time right now. I often will read it right before I drop off to sleep because I know everything that happens in it. I practically memorize the book. It's just kind of my mental comfort food. But one of the reasons I love that book is it maps on to deep-rooted, ancient human mating psychology. So the bo that book will always be relevant. Women will always want the tall, dark, handsome man who, while maybe he doesn't love everybody, loves us, who 
would risk rejection and face down his demons for us specifically, which is what Darcy is. That's exactly who that guy is. So he's kind of what I say in my Texas lingo. Uh, he's the whole enchilada, baby. Yeah. Does that mean we should either hold out for the whole enchilada or just settle? Well, so when you're talking about settling, there are some things that I can tell you for sure you should settle for and other things that you must not. Okay. So here's some things that people over index. They over index height. Uh, I work with a lot of women and men, but the, the women who are heterosexual, 80% of them to 90% say, well, I want to be with a guy who's six feet tall or taller. And what I have to tell these women is, well, so do 80% of women all over the world in all my psych classes and in science conducted in the United States. So if you want the guy six feet tall or taller, you need to understand that the average height of American men is about five feet nine right now. What does this mean for you? It means that relatively few men are six feet tall or taller. And if, the, you're, if you're gonna make that a deal breaker, a lot of you are gonna remain single. So what I encourage people to do is settle for good enough on externals, like how tall he is, how good looking he is. Look, haven't we all known someone where the moment he opened his mouth, we're like, oh, you're just not good looking anymore. Yeah. And haven't we also met men who we knew were not good looking and then we got to know them and now we can't see them as anything else but gorgeous? And the wonderful thing about it is, you know, men change over time. What he looks like now is not what he's necessarily going to look like 50 years down the road. So, yeah, you, you, you can't base it on, on the moment, can you? You can't. Well, I mean, with my own husband, uh, we have one of these photo showers. I, sorry, I have a PhD and I can't talk. But we, <laughs> we have one of these, these things that shows you continually the photos that you put on a an SD card. Okay. And I saw the other day, one of them was rolling by that was us when we got engaged. And of course, we're both much younger. We've been married almost 11 years. And, uh, you know, the fact is, life is hard. Even if you're with the perfect person, everyone will tell you things just happen. And the wear and tear starts to show on both of you. And I saw that picture of him and I thought, oh, what a shame. He's so much better looking now. Oh, well, there you go. Empirically, he is not better looking now, nor am I, but that's the, this is the man I love. Yeah. This is the man I love, and I'm not able to see him objectively anymore, nor should I be able to. Love makes people beautiful. I tie him in with every warm, loving feeling that I have, and I wouldn't change how he looks. That's fantastic. So one of the things, though, that I wonder is I wonder if when you're younger, you can have higher standards, you can hold out for better, but then as you get older, you start to maybe lower those standards. And the person I'm thinking of is Lori Gottlieb, who wrote this article for The Atlantic in 2008, and she turned it into a book. And she said that, that she really regrets the fact that when she had a boyfriend that was good enough when she was younger, she didn't marry him. Because, you know, she, she decided she was going to hold out for someone better. She ended up being 40. She still wasn't married. She had to go to a sperm donor to have a child, and she regrets it. So is it true that maybe our standards can, can shift as we age? It's definitely true that people's standards need to shift as we age, but perhaps not in the ways that Lori Gottlieb meant. And I have to say, I didn't read that article, so I can't speak to exactly what her standards were. But let me just take a wild guess based on what I know from science. She wanted someone who was tall, dark, handsome, rich, well-connected, funny. Everyone wants funny. And, or every woman wants funny. And uh, he abjectly adored her, and she was madly in love with him. Okay, here are the parts of that that are standards you should ne never let go of. You need to feel like you're in love with the guy, and he needs to show you in in ways that you emotionally connect with, that he's there for you and that he loves you. All the rest is something that you should be compromising on. All the rest. The money, the height, the looks. Here's what's reasonable to ask for at any age. Someone who matches you. But I will say there's one caveat to that. If you're very young and very beautiful, then you can hold out for the brass ring. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you're not very young or very beautiful, and I'm speaking obviously from a heterocentric uh, standpoint or heteronormative standpoint right now, uh, this doesn't apply to lesbians. It doesn't apply to uh, 
some other people, but it does apply if you want a man. Men, I cannot tell you how strongly men value youth and beauty. So if you have youth and beauty, you can trade that for resources and height and connections. But if you don't have it, you can't. So for example, I've had to have some really hard conversations with clients on occasion where I've had to say something along the lines of, so you want the guy who makes half a million dollars free and clear every year, who is over six feet tall, very handsome, he's going to be faithful to you. That's a big ask, by the way. Let's take uh, Chris Rock, for example. That guy said in one of his comedy routines, hey, you know what? You guys are all going to think of me as the guy who cheated on his wife twice and got divorced. But how I think of me is, do you know what it's like being me? Women offer them, they offer themselves, they offer free sex to me every single day. And out of thousands and thousands of times, I only said yes twice. I'm a hero. So what I'm saying is, you know, when I talk to these clients and I say, these, these heterosexual women clients, and I say, okay, when you ask for a guy who's all that, you're asking for a guy who odds are huge, he's going to be unfaithful to you. If you're additionally requiring his fidelity, you have got to be, you're, you're just, you're making it where no one is going to meet your standards. And the men who do meet your standards are going for women 20 years younger if you're now in your 40s. So let's look at one of the standards, though, that, that we do have that is reasonable, as you said, and that is that you're madly in love and that he acts madly in love with you. I think for a lot of women, there's the question of, is what I'm feeling inside enough? I like him. I like our relationship together. I like everything we do together. But is this a strong enough feeling for something to last a lifetime? How do they know? How do they know? I was getting a massage one time and, and my massage therapist, her husband of 25 years had just died. And she told me about their marriage. They didn't know each other very well when they got married. It was almost like an arranged marriage, even though they weren't from that kind of culture. They got married quickly because they felt that they should, not because they had actually taken the time to do an, an involved courtship. And she said, you know, everyone tells you that you have to be in love. She said, for most people, the love comes before marriage. In my case, the love came after. She said, I was with somebody that I dearly loved more every year for 25 years. Here's the wonderful thing about women. If someone just treats us really well and we're attracted to them, it's hard for us not to love them. In fact, in studies, it's hard for women who are having sex with a guy they don't even like to stay emotionally disconnected from that guy 75% of the time, 75% of women become emotionally tied up in a guy that they're having sex with, who they got sexually involved with in a friends with benefits situation because they knew the guy wasn't good for anything else. So the danger with women is not that we attach to someone that we can't love. It's that we actually attach to people we shouldn't love, first of all. And here's one of my favorite things about men. So I often hear from women who say, well, he's asked me out. I can't tell if he's attracted to me. Here's how you can tell he's attracted to you. He asked you out. If he keeps asking you out, odds are really good that he's still really attracted to you. Oh. Men are kind of, they're binary in this. They, they love you or they don't. They're attracted to you or they aren't. And when men fall in love, they tend to stay in love really forever. I have so many male clients who are years later trying to get over a relationship that didn't work out. Most of my female clients aren't like that. They're sad maybe a little bit about a relationship that didn't work out, but they're ready to move on. It's actually, scientifically, it's harder for men. So women, what you need to look for is a man who has the qualities. Uh, here's, here's a really simple way of putting it. Studies on arranged marriages show that arranged marriages are usually happier after the wedding than chosen marriages are. And that's because arranged marriages, somebody finds somebody who's as similar to you as humanly possible, but the opposite sex. And you then, all you have to determine is, do I think he's hot enough to have sex with? Yes. Okay, I'll marry you. No. Okay, mom and dad keep looking or matchmaker keep looking. Those marriages actually work really well because what are the odds if, if your family finds somebody who's just like you? By the way, people never fight about their similarities. They fight about their dissimilarities. So if your family finds somebody who's just like you and you're hot for him and he feels the same about you, what are the odds this is going to fail? Almost zero. Wow. So compatibility matters. If love were enough, my client base would be almost gone overnight. Wow. So love is not a, it's, it's what scientists call necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like you have to have love because without it, you're probably going to cheat women. I mean, that's empirically true. Women who don't love tend to cheat. 
but just loving someone doesn't make that person right for you. You know, almost everyone is in love on the day that they get married. So if love were enough, the divorce rate would be almost nothing. The divorce rate is a lot lower than people think it is. People think it's 50-50 and it's actually two-thirds in favor of lifetime and one-third divorce. Okay. Now, you actually work with clients. You work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. You've got a free love science blog. And of course, you've got your books, which we'll talk about in a minute. Talk to us a little bit about your coaching practice. Sure. Well, I see men and women, gay and straight, trans and cisgender. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I want everyone to have love. And most of my clients are single and they are looking for the right relationship. But I have a substantial portion of my clients who are dealing with a breakup, are trying to decide whether to break up, or are trying to decide whether to marry the person they're actually with or, or what level of commitment they really want with the person they're with. So pretty much if someone is in any phase of relationship from preparing for relationship to determining what the next step is to maybe having to exit a relationship, that's who I work with. And I work with them one-on-one -on, -one on Skype, FaceTime, and phone. And all over the world, I have clients in New Zealand and Australia and Scandinavia and the UK and, uh, I don't speak other languages very well, so I don't tend to have people in other countries unless they speak English. Unfortunately, I'm one of those Americans who only speaks English. Oh, well, that's fine. So you've <laughs> also got, you've got Love Factually, the, the first book, and you've got a new book coming out this January, and it's for single parents. That's right. So my first book is called Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps from I Wish to I Do. And it's the first book that uses science instead of opinion to guide men and women to find the right partner and to do the, the self-work that they need to do uh, in order to do that. The second book is called Love Factually for Single Parents and Those Dating Them. And it's exactly that. It is a science-based advice book that is intended to help single parents or someone dating a single parent to determine how to get into the right relationship and how to keep that relationship. It's got a number of differences with my first book. For those of you who've read my first book, this book has a lot more exercises. It has a free notebook slash exercise book that comes with it. Um, and it is my first book to talk about what happens after you've chosen this person. So it sets you up for lifetime love with your chosen partner because it teaches you how to communicate around the issues of children and around the issues uh, that inevitably come up with any couple. So it's a little bit, it's quite different actually. And I recommend that people read both of them. The book launches on January 7th and you can get a free chapter right now today. As of yesterday, the free chapter has gone live on my website, which is love factually with an f dot co love factually dot co fantastic well thank you duena for coming on and i wondered if you had any last message you would like to leave our viewers with yes if i had to sum up all the science that's ever been done on intimate relationships in one sentence here's that sentence if you can find and be someone kind and respectful your love life will go well and if you can't it won't and those are the standards we need to look for. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And thank you out there for watching. We hope to see you again soon. Until then, let your brilliance shine.